My name's Jamie Turner. I'm a CTO of a company called Post Good Anywhere. For those of you in the UK, you will probably never heard of us, but you will almost certainly have used our software. I'll touch on that in a second. Um, also presenting, not in person, but down at the front, is Joe from Big Data Partnership. Um, rather than us doing a bit of a tag team, we thought it probably made more sense for me just to start off with this. Um, and if you've got any other real techie questions, then I'll drag him up on stage later on. Um, this talk is probably a bit different to some of the others that you've seen today. It's less techy, if I'm honest. It's actually looking at things from a bit more of a pragmatic point of view. Um, we are a relatively new user of Cassandra. We're blending it with other bits of uh, that kind of like cool big data -y type stack. And this is really about some of our experiences, some of our decisions, and what we're trying to do with it that, that's a little bit different. Uh, building on, for example, on what we've seen in some of the other sessions, those of you who went to the one about event processing in Cassandra uh, first thing this morning, uh, a lot of what those guys are doing is something that we are working on and then taking, I guess, to another level and so on. So hopefully there should be some interesting bits in there. So as I touched on, Postgre Anywhere is, uh, is a company that I co-founded about 14 years ago. You will never have heard of us. As I said, the Brits here will almost always have used us um, about five and a half billion times over the last 14 years or so. We provide address capture in uh, different websites, call centers, that kind of stuff. Incredibly unsexy, but surprisingly important in the way that uh, retail and so on is done today. Black Friday, which was last Friday, one of these ridiculous uh, imported retail events was our biggest day ever. We did 15 million transactions in a day, peaking at one and a half thousand in one second at about half past one in the afternoon, just proving that people got a bit mad at lunchtime. Um, I want to sort of put a bit of context into why we ended up looking at Cassandra and that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to bore you with the details and some awful sort of story, but just to put things... I guess, to look at where, where this whole project came from. We started off as a very small business, and as a small business, one of the things you have to do is to differentiate yourself. And for us, that's really about service. We're selling someone else's data. Yes, we were putting it on the web, and that was crazy new in 2000. You know, most people are on dial-up. We're providing a cloud service before anyone knew the cloud was the cloud. So this was pretty, pretty innovative, pretty different, pretty difficult. You know, you have to guide people through. And also, we've got no money. So you have to try and provide really, really high levels of service. Now, in an online environment, that can be quite tricky. But if you're small and you can offer that kind of small business level of service, it's actually not too difficult because you know your customers. You know, if you've got, say, a handful of people in the office and maybe a handful of customers, you know, 10s, 20s, 30s, maybe less than 100, you know what's going on with them. You know when someone's just registered, you can get a sense that they're struggling to log in, so you might give them a hand. And all these sorts of nice, fuzzy bits of service around the side that you would ideally like to automate, but you can make decisions and improve their experience as a result of that. So in a very small way, small businesses are better at it because you've got that human element there, and you can start to try and make an experience that is very, very personal to them because you know that person and you understand what's happening to them and you understand the context of maybe their difficulties or opportunities that present themselves. That is incredibly hard to scale, though, because you can do it with a few hundred people. You can't do it with a few hundred thousand people, certainly not using individuals to do that. You know, if you look at your classic big corporate uh, customer service center approach, you're dealing with trying to migrate people off to individual teams. You're almost trying to do human sharding by guiding your inbound traffic to these little teams to make them work like little units. It doesn't work. It never works at all. None of us like phoning call centers because you are treated like a machine by someone who is being forced to act like a machine. That's no good to anyone. So not only is it difficult to scale and very hard to maintain those levels of service, and it is service that in an increasingly competitive world is often your biggest thing that you can win with, it's also incredibly expensive to do properly. So how do you deal with that? Well, you have this horrible dilemma of what we in the business call tin over skin, which is a terrible way of describing people and machines. But machines are very cheap. They can give you great capacity, and they can give you incredible consistency. And if you look at most of the big companies that are out there, most of what tends to work, it's about consistency. No one really likes Starbucks, but you know how to get a coffee, and you know how it works. No one really likes McDonald's, but you've got a fighting chance that it's going to be the same almost everywhere. You know, these sorts of things are important to people because you're helping them to understand how the process works. You're trying to make it simple for them. 
but people are really good at understanding the individual. They're understanding that someone comes in and looks sleepy, maybe they do need that extra shot. You know, maybe they're looking a bit cold in the shed, or maybe they should get that donut. That's not just about upselling, it's about being a little bit smarter and looking at a wider picture. Not just those individual tiny facts that as a machine I'm processing, it's looking at things at a much broader scale. And then the final thing here, which humans are very good at, which is a bit of an odd thing, and probably not the best word to use, is compassion, but really by that I mean empathy. Because if I understand what you're experiencing, what you're going through as a user, and obviously things like buying a pair of trousers off Amazon could be a hugely painful experience, so having that empathy is really important. But if you can see where it's not quite working, that's really good. For those of you who were trying to buy stuff on Black Friday, I'm sure a whole bunch of you went to websites that decided to put you in a queue, sometimes a queue of 100,000 people, you know, in the expectation that you're going to stay there. Well, of course I'm not going to stay there. I'll just go to the next website. You know, why would I do that? If I wanted to go and buy something, I tried to buy a TV at the weekend. I couldn't find anywhere with a high-res photo of it because I wanted to check that it looked kind of pretty in the corners. They're not making it easy for me. And a human would see that very, very quickly, and you would detect that in a real store. So for us as a business, we, as we grew, started to add on customers. We were providing a piece of technology which is not necessarily completely obvious. And we'd got to a stage where, for us, it was very easy to pick up a phone to a customer and say, you're struggling, what's going on, let us see if we can help you. But you can't do that for everyone. So we spun up an internal project. This is about sort of three or four years ago to try and automate the best of what we did, which we called Trigger. The idea of this was really about looking at what we could find out about what's going on with our customers and trying to infer what that meant. Now, we deal with a lot of data, but we aren't a big data company. We still use the traditional software. So we're a Microsoft house, we're a SQL house. You know, we don't do anything particularly special on that front. And for many people, it's surprising that you can get those sorts of volumes and that kind of speed out of that traditional stack. You don't have to go completely sort of um, on the edge of, edge of space with all of this Hadoop stuff. You can do a lot with what's out there already, but you hit up a wall really, really quickly. So, looking at what we were trying to do, we had this sense that we needed to explore a bit further because we saw there was external potential and there is only so far you can go with that technology stack we were looking at. So the way that this works for us is we have these things called sensors. They're deployed not just in our website. That's where everyone starts to try and look for behavioral activity. But it's not about someone coming to our website and looking around. It's about their experience of us. So it's incorporated into our monitoring systems, our phone systems, other bits and pieces that we get from Twitter and those sorts of things to try and get a sense of exactly what's going on, a far more holistic view of what our customers' experience is. That's a really important thing because, again, just seeing that someone's looked at this page on the website tells me nothing. Maybe the fact that I've looked at it several times tells me something more. Maybe the fact that I've looked at it several times really, really quickly tells me a bit more. Adding on these bits of data, these extra dimensions, gives you a richness to build that picture, improve the resolution of that. But to try and make sense of that, to try and get some context to it, we came up with this idea of playing games. Now, we started off, and they were literally kind of games, state machines, for those of you with a comp side background, um, snakes and ladders, for those of you from a marketing background. <laughs> it's something that is very easy for people to understand. You know, you start off at the starting square, and you wiggle around, and you go down snakes, and something bad's happened. You go down several, and it's all gone terribly wrong. But then some good things happen. And ultimately, hopefully, you proceed to a win state, Maybe you've made a purchase, maybe you've made a conversion, maybe there's a support case which has gone and completed correctly, well done for us, or a fail outcome, a, win, a loss rather. You know, you've left, you've bailed, you've abandoned your checkout, you no longer want to talk to us anymore, everyone's ended up with a bit of a huff. Whereabouts you are in that journey at any one point in time is really important because the closer you get perhaps to that win state, and as soon as you start to divert from it, that's where actually we maybe want to consider doing something about it. Because understanding where people are in this process and trying to get a sense of their behaviours and ultimately what they're thinking, this idea of what their mood is, is terrific until you say, well, what am I going to do about it? And I need to do something about it there and then. As with almost everything in life, timing is everything. 
So having a big batch job that processes all of this stuff and then tells me that, oh yeah, you lost a customer three weeks ago, that's no good to anyone. If it can tell me I'm going to lose them very, very shortly, now I can do something about it. That's really, really important. But what to do, what choice to make, again, is really tricky. Because I can use standard multivariant testing, in other words, a whole bunch of ideas and fling this one at them and fling this one at them and try and see which one works. That's a really good start. And actually, because we have an idea of a win and a loss, because we have an idea of a context here, because we can actually assign probabilities to all of that stuff and we can see how quickly they made that win and how much of a win was it, was it 10 quid, was it 100 quid? All of those things can build together so that we can start to decide how critical this is. Is this a really important intervention where actually I'm going to pick up the phone, I'm going to send someone around, I'm going to post them some flowers because we've got it horribly wrong? Or is it something where I'm going to get a nice little on-screen prompt? When this sort of stuff is done badly, and we've all seen it when you go to a new website and after about five seconds, you've got a little pop-up that comes up and says, take this uh, opinion poll. Tell us what you think of our website. I've looked at it for five seconds. I've got no bloody clue what your website does. And now this is just hiding all the stuff that I was looking at in the first place. That's a bad intervention. That's not going to succeed in taking me towards a useful outcome. But the other thing also with this is that one size doesn't fit all. So the more that we learn about people, we can start to apply these interventions, see what the outcomes are, but we can start off with a very broad brush approach. But we can see that actually this one doesn't quite work out for everyone. Let's consider that. Let's try and do something about it. Now, this is what we do ourselves. You know, we generate maybe a million events a day or so, so it's really small amounts of things. But if we were to apply it to some of our customers, which are the biggest retailers on the planet, some of them, some of the biggest banks, some of the biggest um, insurance companies and financial services, they have got huge amounts of data. And then you have the classic problem of scaling. The three things that ultimately are what's really valuable to deal with, but also are what's quite hard to deal with. You know, that volume of data where you're actually not looking at maybe a couple of million transactions a day, but maybe a couple of million a minute, maybe even a second. If you look at the velocity, you know, I want to do something about it now. I don't want to worry about, uh, to have a big batch job that tells me in three weeks something's happened. If I'm out by three minutes, that's no good. If I can do it in near real time, that's terrific. That makes a huge difference. If I can try and preempt that, if I can kind of try and predict what's going to happen ahead of time, then that's great. We can do this all sort of minority report style. That's a terrific way of marketing, a terrific way of serving the customer. And then there's the variety, because in order to build this picture of what's going on with your customers, you need to have all that data. You can't just look at things through that tiny, narrow, narrow picture. The wider you can look and the more media you can examine, whether that's emails, whether that's tweets, whether that's photos, whether it's all these other different things, they will all build that picture that you can then start to turn into something more useful. So at the core of this is data collection, and that's ultimately why we're here today, because this is where Cassandra really came into our world. We're SQL people. We like SQL. We understand it. We've grown up with it. It's terrific. It doesn't scale. My SQL looked like it did, but it was horrible. We got very, very confused very early, and Oracle's kind of made it all a bit scary. Mongo looks really pretty from a developer point of view. You know, it's got really nice interfaces, but trying to shard it up, to grow it on a cluster, trying to manage that with bits falling off left, right, and center, it was horrible. Really, really tricky to use. Internally, the more you looked at it, the more it really felt like it had been made in a garage. And <laughs> <laughs> the more worrying that became. Plus, ultimately, databases are about storing data. And at least having a fighting chance that they might do that. You start slinging data at Mongo, God knows where it's going to end up. You know, some of it's sprouting out in the network. The driver kind of thinks I've got it, but who knows? You know, you can't play data roulette with anything that's important. Some of these bits of data might not be important, but a lot of it is. And then there's Cassandra, something that actually you can scale out without having to have demons here and nodes here and all sorts of processes running that have all got to be started in the right order and that kind of stuff. It just kind of worked. And it's sort of got CQL, which looks sort of like SQL, so we feel sort of happy with that and it's not too scary. There's not too many curly brackets everywhere. That, you know, just <laughs> for anyone who's done anything with Elasticsearch, it's just, ah, it's horrible. But it's really cool. We'll come on to that in a bit later. 
And for those of you who are kids of the 80s, of which probably an alarming number of you aren't, it is like getting a PC in the 80s, because you hadn't got that kind of duality of, oh, am I going to get a Mac or am I going to get a PC? It's, am I going to get a Spectrum or a BBCB or an Auric or a Dragon thing or any of these sorts of things? These databases are coming out like a rash at the moment. And the innovation is amazing. It's really cool. And it's great to see that. You know, data's kind of suddenly quite cool again. How half of these things work, God knows. But they sound really interesting. <clears throat> So how do you choose something like this? What processes do we go through? Well, first of all, we're a .NET house, so we can't go completely open source. That would just blow our brains to bits. So we need a little bit of a linchpin there in .NET world so we feel sort of comfortable and warm. A lot of these things don't support well .NET. And that's important for us because we can leverage all of our code base. We can do all of our billing systems. We've already got that. We can bring in our monitoring systems. We've already got that. So we don't want to go completely, completely into a big new world. And test. Prove what they say. You know, these ideas of durability and consistency, does it actually work under duress? If you start throwing data at these things, and you start pulling network leads out, and you start pulling power on the nodes, do you really have those guarantees of durability? You do in Cassandra. We stuck loads of data at it, all sorts of different ways of trying to break it. And the only times that it ever lost data, it always told us that it had. You always knew that, OK, fine, that node's down, time out you've got to do something about it. And it had actually gone. Didn't have that with Mongo. That was, that was a real leaky sieve. And then ask. You know, if you're starting out like we were, this is all new stuff to us. Ask the community, which is fantastic for Cassandra. But also ask your peers, ask anyone who will talk to you. But then also, in our case, ask some pros. Ask some people who have actually done this before. There's a lot of you in this room who have got exceptional experience with this kind of stuff. Share it as much as you can. Because there's lots of people who want to get on board with this and want their eyes open to, to really what's out there. In our case, through a, a friend of a friend, we brought in a, a, a bunch from down here. We're based up in the, the muddy Midlands. Um, called the Big Data Partnership. These guys specialize in this kind of stuff. They have people from proper big data users. Guys who work for CERN and all this kind of stuff. That's proper data. You know, not a few postcodes slung around all over the place, which is what we're used to. You know, if you're dealing with huge volumes and you've got people who understand their craft properly, understand how it scales, understand how it deals with failure, can train you, can work at your level and that kind of stuff, embrace that as well. You know, we actually got these guys in for two days to help validate our Cassandra schemas to prove that we hadn't kind of gone too SQL and normalized too much and understood exactly how things were working on disk. What was amazing for us, though, is having those conversations with these guys who Cassandra is a small part of what they do. And there's that bigger stack of all the smarts. You know, we were building these games, these games of snakes and ladders for people to, to use. And as soon as we tried our first beta deployment, we passed it up to team marketing upstairs. You know, they kind of understood the snakes and ladders stuff. But to try and build these state machines, to try and assign numbers to it, it's just a nightmare. And actually, you put in that shoe, of course people can't do that. It's too subjective. And this is one of the big things that we start to learn. As soon as you start thinking about using this whole plethora of different bits of technology, it's really important to open your eyes and let the data speak for itself. You know, we have too many people who play around with data, who are data analysts, who are, you know, these kind of people who love Tableau and there's all sorts of graphs and pretty pictures and stuff that I can swirl around, but they don't understand the data, they don't understand the numbers. They're just reinforcing their existing prejudice. Let the data talk for itself. This is what these guys, BDP, said to us. And so we started looking at machine learning, ways of looking at these event streams, figuring out what was important and what wasn't, and then clustering it into common behavior groups. You know, it takes a lot of the work out for us, but it also means because the whole model is very publicistic, we can figure out if you're here, you are likely to get to a win state with this, this uh, probability. And to support all of that in a big thing, you have to think differently. So we start looking at Spark to do these big batch clustering jobs. Start looking at Spark streaming to do these real-time prediction jobs. You know, again, from a .NET world to data that is now spinning across nodes all over the place that you're trying to organize, it's tricky, it's challenging, but it's enormous fun and incredibly rewarding. So the solution for us was Cassandra at the core of it. Because it works, and it kind of isn't scary, and you can scale it without fiddling around too much. But it's not without its limitations. 
you know, one of the things with Cassandra is that if you build your schemas properly, it is crazy fast at accepting this data and great at taking it out and doing analysis based on those designed use cases. But the flexibility that we're used to in a more traditional environment and that a business will always demand actually sometimes is not that good at that. You need to add stuff to it. You need something alongside it. For us, that was Elasticsearch. Query language is horrible. Don't get me wrong. It's absolutely horrible, but it's incredibly flexible. And it scales in a similar way to Cassandra. It's really nice. You know, I know there's a lot of work with, um, I was talking to someone over lunch about solar with Cassandra. But Elasticsearch scales much more nicely. Um, and it's got a lot of the same principles behind it that I would definitely recommend anyone take a look at that. Because the two things together give you kind of the best of both worlds. And then Spark is this compute engine, something that you can start slinging these jobs out and start dividing them up. And with streaming on top, you can actually turn them around really, really, really fast using the same code base. So when we do a big reclustering exercise to try and understand what are the common behaviors that we experience from our customers? What are they doing? Where are they? Are there differences, this kind of stuff? At the end of that, we then have to go through and put everyone into their little groups. So we've got a massive batch exercise to try and update people. Spark drags that data out of Cassandra, throws it back in, throws it back into Elasticsearch at just a phenomenal rate, which is fantastic for us. But it then also means that as we go along, we're using that same code base, those same models, which are all stored in Cassandra, and synchronizing everything up all across these clusters that are very, very scalable. So as we start to grow, start to add more customers, we can maintain that performance. So in terms of how all the bits fit together, sort of classic picture of boxes and lines and probably lines missing. But the data comes in first and foremost into the .NET world. Again, this is where we're comfortable. This is where we actually orchestrate everything. There are other ways of doing it, but for us, this seems like a good center point for us because we can debug it easily. We know what's going on. Data gets streamed off into Cassandra, really as our primary storage mechanism. The event information gets pulled from Cassandra and then pushed straight into Spark Streaming so that we can then start the prediction function. In the back end, we're doing all of our authentication, authorization, billing processes. We also squirrel the data away off into Elasticsearch so that we've got near real time, really cool analytics that we can start doing with it. And the result goes back to the customer, probably in about a tenth of a second, maybe uh, to 200 mils, something like that. Then, every day, every week, depending on the schedule, we do these big bulk recomputes. We actually see, are those clusters still right? Have we identified anything that's new? And that's then more traditional Spark, talking to Cassandra, and just churning lots of data and doing lots of math. This is what all these different bits are really good at. Yes, it's more complicated. There's a lot more boxes there than we're used to. But it all works. So I guess for us, for us as engineers, I think one of the things that I would say has surprised me is all through my career, as data volumes have increased, so has the hardware, so has the software, so has the memory, so has compute. So basically, that data that you could probably stick on an access database with about 1,000 users back in the sort of mid-90s, you're now doing architecturally not a million miles away from it on a nice Dell server that's got SQL on it, that's got loads of memory, loads of RAM, and you're benefiting from everything being in the same place. And that's great because you're really privileged that you can keep it all in there. But as soon as you start having to scale out, you've really got to understand what's going on. And especially in things like Cassandra, you really need to understand where the data is, how the queries are going to work. Because a lot of it can be quite easily obfuscated for you. Cassandra actually is very, very good at trying to stop you doing any really dumb queries. You know, we're all used to sometimes in SQL doing just because it's lazy, select star from customers or whatever. And there might be a few thousand, a few hundred thousand, a few million, and that's sort of not too much of a problem. If you've got a really large cluster in Cassandra, maybe composing hundreds of nodes, you do that, then the whole thing is going to go to worms really, really fast. You don't want to be doing that. And so it's really important that you start to get your head around how all these things work. But also the benefits are enormous because you have that scalability. And you've then got built-in redundancy. You know, you're not basically betting the farm on this one box that you know can't really break. And so you start panicking, and so you start sticking RAID in it, and you start adding more things and more PSUs. Again, the basic model of just design for the failure to be dealt with in software. Hardware is rubbish. No one likes it. You know, that's why we put it into cold, dark rooms. 
<laughs> you know, try not to worry too much about it. You know, but deal with the software, deal with the stuff that's nice. You don't have to get your fingers dirty and those sorts of things. It's much, much better. Um, and as I said, I would really say to anyone who's embarking on projects like this, or using these sorts of things, do talk, talk, uh, you know, talk to the guys here, talk to anyone you can find who's willing enough and daft enough to listen. Talk to BDP, who are you know, awesome from our point of view. Really like to uh, you know, give them a really good shout out. But also, you know, enjoy it, because it's tremendous fun. Um, and if you've got any questions, please shout. Uh, but thank you very much for your time, and thank you very much for listening. Yes? Did it work? Did you convert those grumpy customers into happy ones? It does. Fantastic. It does. And it's, I, sometimes it's a bit spooky. Um, you can't be too predictive. Um, but a lot of the times what we do is we'll see there's been a problem or there's about to be a problem and we fix it. And then just, you know, if it's escalated up to us, um, then we'll just sometimes drop them an email and say, look, we saw you about to have a problem. We've done this, this and this. It's all absolutely fine. You know, smiley face. Happy days. And that's great. You know, and that means, you know, for us as a core business, we are, we are rubbish at sales, absolutely hopeless, but we're really good at retention. So we don't lose customers. It just takes a while to acquire them. Um, but in my view, that's a much better business model. If you try and build things in a way that people want to buy it rather than having to sell it, that's far easier. Yes? Uh, two questions. Were you using to communicate between Spark Streaming and .NET? Spark Streaming and .NET? So the, uh, to push the stuff out into Spark that's going to Kafka, and then it gets spun out onto the Spark cluster, and then the individual sort of knows there when they process the job, they actually make a callback, an HTTP sort of restful callback to the uh, starting node. So trying to actually manage that synchronization has been a bit of a challenge, um, and obviously things can go a bit wrong. Uh, we, we're kind of pushing Spark streaming really in a way that it's probably not meant to work, um, but it kind of works. So. Um, uh, not so much. It, it can be a bit... Things that happen when you expect them to, if I'm honest, certainly the aggregations and those sorts of things, you can start pumping the data in and it appears there, but some of the aggregations are a little bit behind. Um, we did some analytics stuff for Black Friday, and trying to do those in real time didn't work. Um, and if I'm completely honest, we're not quite sure why. Um, that's something we're looking at at the moment because. Sorry, say that again. No, no. So I mean, to get the stuff out of Elasticsearch, you just all straight nest and that kind of stuff, um, which is kind of why it's horrible. There's only so many nested lambda expressions that are sensible. So. We use that internally because obviously it's a great tool just for sort of uh, working the data and that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of what the customers see, we pull that stuff out and then do the pretty visualizations. We've got a really cool sort of creative design team that are good at coloring stuff in and makes it look really cool. Hey. Yeah, so. So you, this is actually a really interesting thing because we're something we're experiencing, but we're trying to really tune it down. And it looks like we can tune it right down. Um, it puts a lot more load on stuff because you've kind of got more of an overhead in terms of dispatching and coordinating those jobs. Um, but we're getting it down to like about sort of 200 mils or something. We think we can do better. Hey. So uh, would Storm be an alternative? Um, we looked at it. And we discounted it in favor of Spark Streaming because it seemed a bit cooler. Yeah. Um, <laughs> can't really give you a more sensible answer than that, but it kind of it ties everything together quite nicely for us as well. And there's so much investment going into Spark and Spark Streaming at the moment. You know that feels like a real sort of rising curve, and it you know all the connectors with Cassandra it's really pretty, and really nice to work with. So yeah, it's new and shiny, so that gets a bit tick. Cool. Oh hi, sorry. <laughs> Ah, oh, it's a really difficult question, isn't it? 
Um, I'm going to give you a hor <coughs> horrible answer. I always believe that actually you, we've had a whole bunch of dead ends, but they've been really constructive because I think we've learned more, or well, you always learn more from all the terrible ideas you have rather than all the good ones. Um, we probably would have bailed on trying to push the idea of manually creating the games. We, we got to a stage where trying to build them automatically looked so complicated, it got a bit kind of cold feet, if I'm honest. And so try to, we probably lost a couple of months in saying, okay, just, we need to get this, we need to get something out the door, rather than sort of taking a step back and say, look, th there's not a, you know, if we don't get it out a month early, that's not really going to make a blind bit of difference anyway, and we'd rather get it right. And in the last, you know, sort of six, eight weeks or so, we're moving the thing into like a commercial beach in, in January. Um, you know, everything's coming together and it's looking so cool. And if we'd not had some of those dead ends, I don't think we would have appreciated it. And actually, you know, some of the challenges of getting all the things together, also, if I'm honest, you know, to answer your point about sort of start streaming or storm, you know, that extra couple of months means that some of these other technologies are viable, but they actually work. Um, you know, even things like in Cassandra, you know, the Cassandra driver for C Sharp in May was horrible. You know, you started to put any volume through it and it would lock up and, you know, wasn't too happy at all. That's all obviously been re-engineered and that's really beautiful now. You know, you really start to throw some stuff at it. Um, and so because all of these technologies are so, um, the pace of change in them is so rapid, a, a week here is like a, probably a year in Microsoft world, you know, so things are moving on at an incredible pace, which is, which is why it's so much fun. Oh, yeah, one more, yeah. Um, what language are you using for um, It's all in Scala. Yeah, yeah, with some of it, um, I think I'm now looking down here, that's right, isn't it? Python. Python. Uh, Python. And Scala? Python. Both of them. Yeah, I didn't do that bit. <laughs> Everyone got really excited about it, but I didn't do that bit. Um, I think one of the ideas is to try and migrate some of the Python through to Scala, ultimately, because obviously that works better in, in the environment. But, um, but yeah, bit of bit of pick and mix right now. Uh, how do you distinguish data from Cassandra to Spark Streaming? Is it real time, is it serious, content? So for Spark Streaming, it actually comes from .NET. So when the events come in, we spin some off into Cassandra for storage, and then we spin some off straight through Kafka and then onwards into Spark uh, Spark Streaming. How does Live from Cassandra to Spark? So that is for the bulk. Uh, the bulk jobs, so the reach classification, like the clustering algorithm, the clustering thing. So that's a big bulk job that's done like once a week or once a day, depending on it, and that like reclassifies everything. Um, and then you've got your sort of interactive constant, constant churn. Hey. Online, uh, or, or any... So clustering is actually we're using expectation maximization. Um, the in future, hopefully, we might be able to do it incrementally and avoid the whole batch job stuff. That's a, a sort of piece of active research at the moment. Uh, but that's very, very early days. If we've got something that kind of works, then we can live with that for you know, a few months and stuff. And Hi. <laughs> Will you post the video of this? Uh, yeah, I think I have a horrible feeling it might have been recorded somewhere along the line, so yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, I've been told also that um, I think it's... Tea and coffees are on the first floor in the Thames suite or something. Uh, but thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate your questions. <laughs> <laughs>